All right, so today, today we uh, finally finished the Sirens of Titan. I'm gonna try to get some, uh, some of the major themes on the table and explore them a little bit. <clears throat> I guess we've got this notion of time that pervades throughout the reading. I don't like this red. Hopefully I got a better one in my pocket. I'll try this black. Time is something that's really important. Purpose, I guess. Sometimes higher purpose or something like this. Friendship. Definitely. And I don't know how to write this as like a one word, but this sort of idea that, um, oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll, but this is easy. I just thought of this. Determinism versus free will. Knowledge versus ignorance, that's another one that just popped into my head. And the one that I was trying to articulate a moment ago is like, well, there's this sort of idea of, I don't know how to put this, but it's sort of like coming up against a wall, right? That like, that humans, we, you know, humans, humanity as a whole or as individuals, we're looking for higher purpose, a higher aim or whatnot. And oftentimes this leads us to folly and we come upon like a like a brick wall kind of thing, the way that Rumford fell into the in chronosynclastic infundibulum, you know. And also the way I suppose you could argue there's other examples of this in the book, like the the legend of the Tralfalmadorians, right? The, uh, the humans or whatever they were, the people that originally created them were looking for a higher purpose, and then they found something that was higher than what they were doing, but it wasn't high enough. So they kept looking and they kept looking, and then they built robots to like deal with the lower the lower tasks until there was nothing for them to do, and and then the robots had to find out what their purpose was, and the robots said, "Well, you have no purpose, basically." And then they said, that sucks. We want things with purpose. So we're going to start killing each other and this sort of thing. And so there seems to be like this folly that um, stupidity, folly, naivete, whatever, that Vonnegut wants to point out in our attempts at grandiose, bigger, larger than life plans when we could just sort of find happiness in the here and now. That seems to be a, a big theme of the book. So I don't know how to put that as a theme. I guess, I don't know, man's or humanity's arrogance, I guess, is one way. But also that leaves out the sort of other part of that theme is that this arrogance leading us, it's almost like a moth to the light, a moth to the flame, you know? And all these people think about it. Um, Rumford died looking for a higher meaning. Think about it. He wanted to know what was in that message and what would have happened if he found out. He probably would have been more disappointed and so there's this sort of trick. And, and I don't know, I just thought of this just now. I, I, there's a famous quote from Kant. Kant said once, and I'll get it wrong, but he said something to the effect that the human mind is designed, I hate to say designed, the human mind is such a way, it is in such a way, there's something about the way that humans think uh, such that we're sort of almost designed to ask questions that we can never answer given the way that we're designed right so how does he put it exactly it's like human understanding is such that given the way that it is it can't help but ask these deep penetrating questions for instance is there a god do what happens after i die do i have free will or am i determined we can't help but be curious and want to know the answers to those questions but for kant given our nature given the way that we are constructed and what we're capable of knowing, uh, those answers are always beyond our grasp. We'll never know the answers definitively to those questions in so far as we are the type of beings that we are. So there's this almost this sort of ironic cruelty that we can't help but ask these questions, but we're doomed to never have an answer. Uh, Kant's solution is that it doesn't matter and that there's a practical, there's a sort of practical uh, use for believing in God. There's a practical use for believing in free will. It gives us ethics and a sense of responsibility. So for him, ultimately, it doesn't really matter whether you can prove it or not. Uh, it's better just to assume that it's true, or at least in certain contexts. 
But for Vonnegut, he's just sort of like, let's just give it up, right? Like, you know, you're never gonna find this higher purpose. And when you do, you're gonna come to a dead end. You're gonna, you're gonna jump into this chronos and plastic infundibulum that, that isn't so great. It sounds great, right? It's like, oh, I see all things and how it all fits together. But would you wanna be Kazak and Rumford in the story? I wouldn't, I wouldn't definitely. Especially Kazak, I think that dog, that's just, that would really suck. Imagine being a dog, like he doesn't know what the hell's going on. He's just, you know, like here I am. I guess what they describe at the end of the book, and Vonnegut does, is kind of like indifferent at this point, right? The dog is used to it. You know, dogs usually get excited, they'll bark at every little twig twitch in the woods. And Kazak is kind of like, whatever, you know? It's like, that poor dog. Um, so I still haven't formulated a way to put the point I'm making, right? I guess, again, this sort of arrogance, I don't know, arrogance in the face of the void, right? In face of the void, right? So for him, at least in the universe of Vonnegut, it's a universe that's ultimately void of meaning and void of purpose. Uh, the only purpose that we find is to love whoever is around to be loved. And um, in a way, I think uh, he uses quite a bit of Aristotelian logic. Uh, what do I mean by that? He seems to be guided somewhat by the philosophy of Aristotle. I don't think Vonnegut is an Aristotelian, but a lot of the, 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 a lot of the ways he presents the problems and, and sort of pokes holes in the problems, um, he, it seems like the guy's read a lot of Aristotle. Uh, and I also think this too, because he's got a, a video that I didn't have time to find and probably be able to show it to you guys today, but he goes over, uh, he's got a theory of stories or a theory of narratives or how, how stories are shaped that is, is sort of, you might, uh, you might consider it neo-Aristotelian. Neo but um, why do I say that he seems to be thinking of or inspired by or whatever, uh, uh, there's, there's some Aristotle at play here. Well, Aristotle, you know, as a philosopher, you could classify him as a teleologist. So his, his, his ultimate theory of reality, his, his sort of metaphysics, that's what metaphysics pretty much means, theories of reality, theories of truth, what, what is the nature of the world. His metaphysics is a, is a type of teleology. The word telos, in Greek, it means purpose, aim, goal, end. End in the sense of that towards which I'm aiming, my end. And these are all fine translations of the word telos. So teleology is a theory of ends or a theory of aims or purposes or targets. And Aristotle, his sort of metaphysical view of the universe, is that everything in it has a purpose. Everything in it has a meaning. And uh, think of just even a speck of dust for him. It's, it's, it's there for a reason. There's something it's there for. And all things, all individual objects, kind of fit together in this grand picture of the universe. And each of the smaller, lower, individual things they all come together and they form a higher purpose, a higher aim. So you can think of something as mundane as just like a big lump of clay. For Aristotle, that lump of clay has potential in it. At the moment, it just is a lump of clay. But there's a lot of things I can do with it. And this is true of all things. We all have potential. I have potential, you have potential. We have things that we aren't, but we could be. You could be standing right now, for instance. You could be skipping down the hall and ignoring the lecture, whatever. Um, but a lump of clay, right? Like, what could you do with a lump of clay? Lots, right? Like what? Come on, let's use our imagination. What do you do with clay? A vase. Good, all right. Anything else? Teapot. Teapot, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't want a clay teapot, but I guess you could, yeah. They have to at some point, yeah. clay, ceramics. Teapot, maybe, let's make it into a brick, okay. So now it's a new thing. It's ceased being clay. It's fulfilled itself somehow, and it's become a brick. Now, what can we do with a brick? It's a new thing. It has new potential. There are things that you can do with a brick you can't do with other things, like build a wall, let's say, okay? 
So the clay has become brick. The brick has become a part of the wall. Why do you build a wall? Well, it's part of a fortress, let's say, to, to defend the city. So for Aristotle, this is a sort of process that we see throughout the universe. You have objects with potential that is unrealized. They have an aim or a telos or a purpose through which they realize that, right? The clay becomes brick. Now it has a new purpose, right? It's no longer clay, now it's a new thing, it's brick. It has a new aim, a new purpose to be part of a wall. This is true of all things, everything. And he thinks the universe is a sort of collection of all these processes that are interrelated. And each individual thing reaches its aim, reaches its goal, its purpose, its end. And by doing so, it supplies the basis for other individual things to fulfill their purpose and fulfill their end and fulfill their aim. Because I use the clay to make brick, I use the brick to build a wall around the city, I'm safer so I don't have to worry about war and I can study philosophy and do science and don't have to worry about marauders coming and destroying my civilization or something like this. So everything has a higher aim and that aim helps other things fulfill their aim as well. Now as human beings, what exactly is our purpose? What is our telos? You could argue that we have very many aims. We have very many teloe, um, that there's just not one purpose. Like for instance, everything you do, he's gonna argue, all your actions, he's gonna argue, you do it because of this, because you have some goal in mind. For instance, the fact you showed up to class today. There's quite a few students who didn't show up, but you did. So obviously you could have done otherwise. Why did you show up to class? What was your aim? He says, there's gotta be some reason. So why are you here? Because I'm so handsome and irresistible. I'm not gonna miss another minute, Mr. Professor Roth. Well, why, why'd you show up? Probably because you, you didn't want to screw up in class, right? You want to follow the material. You want to do good on your paper, right? So you did this because there's a higher aim, right? You didn't just show up to class just to show up to class, right? You show up to class, so you can maybe learn a little bit, maybe get some closure from the science of Titan. Maybe you weren't quite satisfied with it. You kind of want to learn more about it, or maybe you just are interested, or maybe you're not interested at all, but you just know that if you miss too much class, you know, you'll piss me off, but whatever. Y'all have your reasons and you're here, okay? But why did you want to do good on your paper? Why did you want to learn? Like, one, let's say you do really good on your Vonnegut essay. Um, would that be your highest purpose? No. You're, you want to do good on your essay because there's another aim beyond that, right? What's the aim beyond doing good on the Vonnegut essay? Well, you want to get a good grade in the class. You want to get a good grade in the class, okay? But obviously that still isn't your highest aim, right? Like, there's not, it's not like one day, you know, you sat there when you're like a kid or a teenager or whatever, you're like, one day I'm going to take philosophy, I'm going to pass it, and then I'll be fulfilled. Okay? Yeah, if that's not, like, you're not gonna pass this class and be done, right? That's not, so obviously you wanna pass this class because there's a higher aim beyond that. I guess, get a degree, right? So, you know, Aristotle thinks that this, this can keep going on, right? Everything we do, we do for the sake of something else. That thing we might do for the sake of something else. You wanna pass the class because you, you need the credit, so you, it's a part of your degree plan, so you can get a degree. Is that your highest purpose, to get a degree? You just get, okay, so then why, so you, you, you could ask why you want to get a degree. More money. more money, okay. Is that your highest purpose? I want to make more money? Why, could you say, well, why do you want to make more money, right? You, you can still ask that question, makes sense. A better lifestyle? I want to be able to, you know, provide my family, you know, buy nice stuff, you know, make a list of what you're going to do with your money, right? Well, why do you want to do all that? What do you think you're going to achieve with that? And this is where I think you get to the end and you get to your highest purpose, perhaps. Like, what would the answer to that be? Why do you want money? Why do you want to provide for yourself? Why do you want to provide for your family? What do you think you're gonna get from that? Happiness. happiness. And for Aristotle, that's the highest aim for humans, is happiness, is what we're looking for. <clears throat> ultimately, why we do everything we do, it's always for the sake of something else, and that thing is for the sake of, but ultimately we think it's gonna terminate in our happiness. And usually we're thinking of it at least from Aristotle's perspective, in terms of our place in society, right? We're never gonna find happiness, we're never gonna find purpose, because, you know, famously, he said, man is a political animal. He said we're rational, but he also said we're political. What he meant by that is we live with other people. We, 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 we 
Our lives are meaningless outside of the context of a social order. So our purpose is maybe the job that we do. Maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a baker, you know, candlestick maker, whatever the, the rhyme used to be, you know. But whatever you do, you're doing something that is useful, that it, that's, provides a purpose for the greater scheme of things. You know, I guess you're a teacher, you teach the, you know, the kids how to, you know, read, write, arithmetic, all that stuff, so they can be good citizens and they can teach other people and the process keeps going. But ultimately you achieve your highest potential for Aristotle, for him, that's what happiness truly means. A lot of us think of the term happiness as pleasure. It's so, you know, I'm happy is synonymous with I feel good. It's a feeling, it's a state of being. But for Aristotle, he characterizes it more as an activity. It's an active type of happiness. It's doing what's best. The word he uses is actually eudaimonia and a lot of scholars don't like the translation of happiness because they think it's misleading. Happiness, most people think of it as this blissful state. I'm happy, pleasant. But he's not describing that. Certainly if you achieve eudaimonia, you will feel that way occasionally and maybe a lot of times. But you might have a really crappy day, but you still have achieved eudaimonia for Aristotle. It's you, you, you become the best version of yourself possible, basically. Right? You take that potential that's there and you bring out your best potential, your highest potential. And for him, it's an activity of the soul. That's how he defines it. It's an activity of the soul in accordance, in agreement with complete excellence. You, you've developed all your talents to their fullest ability. So maybe you're a Michael Jordan. You know, for him, there, there are things that you're given by nature, and that's what makes us all unique. Nature makes some of us taller, some of us quicker, some of us stronger, some of us maybe more intelligent, less intelligent. That's nature, we can't control that. But given that nature, that allows us to have certain potential that other things don't have. Like you go back to the example of the lump of clay. You know, a lump of clay is good for the teapot, for the vase, and, and for my brick, but it might not be good for lunch. Right, uh, and if I want to make brick or a teapot or uh, you know lump or a brick of clay, Jello might be good for lunch, but not good for those other things. Right. So, given the nature of the substance, you only can expect certain potentialities, and that's also true for human beings. And so, back to the Michael Jordan example. Obviously, he's got some genetics. The guy was taller, an athletic individual, but he wasn't the greatest of all time. Season one. Right, in fact, I think he wasn't really that great in his rookie season. He wasn't, people weren't looking at him like, who's this new guy, Michael Jordan, wow. It was about three or four years after he'd been playing with the Bulls that he started kicking ass. So it's like he had that potential, he develops this, this skill through time, right? Because that's a big thing for Aristotle is that excellence is something that we, we achieve through time, through practice, and it's something that is, um, not intellectual though, it's not just like knowing something and knowing facts, it's almost like learning how to play a, a musical instrument. You can't read a book on how to play a guitar and then play a guitar, you have to pick up a guitar. So you can't just be a good person by reading about what's good in a book or learning a bunch of rules to follow, you have to embody it in your day-to-day -day practice. And then eventually you get better and better at it. You become a better teacher, or as Michael Jordan, a better basketball player. And once you achieve your highest potential and you win, I don't know how many, how many freaking champions, like four or five series that he won, right? World Series, you know, the six, six, right? Six. You know, how much higher can you get? This guy's, you know, he's one of the greatest players of all time. Does that mean he was always smiling like all Joel Osteen? How's it happy? No, he had some bad games. Sometimes he lost. And so does that mean Aristotle's wrong? Because he's like, this is a permanent state. Once you read shit, you always have it. Well, I think that's a misunderstanding of what he means. It's not that you're always like Joel Osteen, Botox smiled 24 seven, you know? <clears throat> but what it means is that even when he had a crappy game, you know, maybe the reporter's like, how do you feel about the game? Michael, he's like, oh, it sucked. You could have played harder. It was horrible. He's like, so you're not happy? He's like, no, I'm not happy. He's like, well, are you happy being Michael Jordan though? That's the bigger question. Can you step back into your whole life and see what you're doing? He said, well, yeah, of course. Like I had a crappy day, things didn't work out right, but I love what I do for a living and you don't win them all and that sort of thing. So it's not this sort of like, I guess the, the sort of new age, uh, what is the, they call the power of positive thinking, that kind of stuff. 
You know, that's not what it is. It's not like, oh, no, no negative thoughts. Never neg no, no you're, you're a realist and things are crappy, but even when you have a crappy day, you, just, you can kind of appreciate what you do have and it doesn't get you down so much. That, that's sort of the, the point. So that's what we're all aiming for, says Aristotle, right? So we have this sort of higher aim of happiness. Now, when we back up, though, and look at the universe as a whole, he ultimately thinks that um, there's a higher aim to the entire universe. We're not going to get into his arguments, but you know, he's got all these arguments for why the, the universe is infinite. This kind of ties into this notion of time. So the universe didn't have a beginning or an end. It just always has been. There's never been like a time when things weren't. So, so for him, he's like, if it's infinite, whatever caused it must be infinite. So there must be some being that's infinite, i.e. God. And for him, God is very, it's very unique. And, and in a way, I have trouble wrapping my mind around this and contemplating it. But God is not the kind of being that you and I are probably thinking of. When he says that God is the sort of cause of the universe, He's not talking about God as the cause, like God decided, hey, I'm gonna make a world now, and he just created the universe. The way that Aristotle talked about causality is a little unique. He talks about, certainly there's a cause in the sense of bringing something about. If I make something, if I build, if I make the clay into brick, I cause the brick, I guess you could say. So there's a cause in that sense. But there's another cause he called the final cause which is, why did I make the brick? What was the purpose? So before I made it, I had a purpose in mind. I'm like, well, why do I want a brick? Maybe I want to start a riot or build a wall or whatever it is, what you do with bricks. So for him, there's a final cause of the universe. There's an aim to which all things unify and are aiming towards. And for him, that is God. You know, God is this force. Everything draws towards it. So all the things that are happening in the universe and God is this perfect being. So everything is trying to be perfect, falling short. That's why we try to reach happiness. We're trying to be as godlike as we can. That's why plants flourish and grow up to the sunlight and all this stuff. Everything is sort of, you know, it's, I don't know, I had a good analogy for this a couple semesters ago when I was teaching Aristotle, and I can't quite get it right now. I wish I was recording that lecture, but it was it's sort of like, you know, when you have desire, right? Like you're hungry, let's say. You know, and so you see that pizza over there, it looks delicious, and you're drawn towards it, right? You didn't decide to want that pizza, you just do, right? You're just naturally drawn towards it. So God is sort of like that, is, is that impulse towards something? In a way, and this is what I was talking about, I think I mentioned Aristotle earlier in the context of Vonnegut, because this is kind of like his UWTV. You remember that? What's the UWTV? universal will to become right it's just it what it's what makes things be something rather than nothing i think that's how he put it right <clears throat> that's kind of like aristotle's god it's like the universal will to become something now here's where i think the the comparison between vonnegut and um, aristotle breaks down because for vonnegut there is no higher aim you know for for for, for vonnegut there is no higher aim than then really one of the one one other thing that I think Aristotle does talk about to his credit is friendship. Right? There's not some higher purpose in the ter in terms of a theological de some deity who cares one way or the other how you live your life, or who controls whether you have good luck or bad luck. That's not what explains all these processes in the universe. Nothing can explain them, says Vonnegut. They just happen. You know, it's just, you know, dust in the wind, to use the old hippie expression, right? But what we can do to get fulfillment, to get happiness, and this, this is a lot like Aristotle, is to, to love people, to love someone, right? To find, to make friends, to make friends, to love whoever is around, to be loved. And most people, I, I would say I'm guilty of this as well, when, when, we, when we teach Aristotle, and we talk about happiness, we talk about eudaimonia, we tend to focus on uh, kind of the, the, the success like you were talking about. And he doesn't equate the two. You can be rich and not happy. You know, you can be uh, the most successful business and not happy. But he also admits you can't be poor either. You gotta, you gotta be able to take care of yourself. If you're starving to death, you'll be screwed. So you gotta find a balance, right? Uh, but he also seems to tie happiness with fulfilling a purpose in your society. 
So having a career, being a teacher, being like, oh, I'm a teacher, I help people, I feel good about that, it makes me feel good, I do what I love, I'm good at it, and that sort of thing, right? Or whatever it is you decide to do. But he also, he, he spends like two, two books in his ethics, in fact, I should write this down, all, all this stuff is coming from his Nicomachean ethics. But he writes a couple books, like there's like 12 books in here, 12 or 13, I can't remember. Towards the end, there's a couple, uh, couple books on friendship because he's, he admits, look, it's not enough to be successful. It's not enough to find what you're good at. If you have no friends to share it with, can you really achieve happiness, right? Can you really achieve eudaimonia? What do you think? I don't think so. Even if you're an introvert, you gotta have someone to share it with, perhaps. You know, you gotta have somebody. But what is a friend? Like, what does it mean to be a friend? And um, I'm surprised there isn't a whole like subgenre of philosophy, like philosophy of friendship, but there isn't. It seems like Nietzsche and Aristotle are the only two that I can think of, two philosophers. I, maybe there's some I don't know of. They're the only two philosophers that, I, that have ever really written extensively on friendship. And even they didn't really write that extensively on it. You know, Aristotle wrote maybe 30 or 40 pages and same thing with Nietzsche. Uh, but what is the friendship? How does he define it? Um, for Aristotle, there are three types of friendship, right? For him, there's what you might call uh, the friendship of utility, right? There's also a friendship of pleasure And then there's what he calls true friendship. So the first two, you probably guess what the he's talking about here. Well, you know, if you know what the word utility means. Like, so what, what do you think he's talking about when he speaks of you, friendships of utility? Well, they might. If they have the same mindset, then they might be of some utility to you. What does utility mean? Useful, right? So, so you might think of like business associates, right? Like you go to a networking event, and maybe you're like you're, I don't know, you're a writer, and you go to a, an event with other writers, and like you get advice from them, and how you get published, and that. So you make friends with them because you have like I guess you said like how do you put it? You have same interests, or you have yeah, business. Yeah, yeah, so it's sort of like a business associate, right? Friend of utility. Uh, pleasure, that's kind of self-explanatory. What do you, like, what would be an example of that? People you like. Yeah, people you like, they're fun. You're party friend, you're drinking buddies or something like that, you know? Um, so he's, you know, for us, you know, typically when we're kids, when we're younger, we, most of our friends are just friends of pleasure. They're friends that we just like because they're fun to be around. Um, and then when we get older, we start looking for careers, we go to college, we, you know, we, then we're like, oh, we gotta be, gotta meet friends in the industry, gotta learn people that work in the industry. And those are necessary, but they're not really true friendship for Aristotle. A true friend is somebody who wants you to, to, do, to achieve this, who cares about you, and wants you to achieve you pneumonia, who wants you to be the best they know you and they know your potential. You can't know what someone's potential, you just met them. You meet somebody at a bar one night and they're funny and you start having jokes and you drink with them all night and you have fun. Immediately you make friends, right? Utility, same thing. Business partners, wow, you got these connections. I got connections too, we can help each other. Let's exchange cards, immediately. But a true friend takes a while. You gotta learn, you gotta learn about them. You gotta learn their habits. You gotta learn what they're capable of, what they're not capable of. Sometimes you gotta tell them stuff they don't wanna hear. Like, dude, I don't think you're in this, right? What was it? There's a, I'm not a huge, I don't really watch Joe Rogan a lot, but there was like this Joe Rogan where he basically called out his buddy because he couldn't fight. He's like, dude, you're not good at MMA. You're gonna get your ass kicked. You saw that? Yeah, he's like, that was an uncomfortable thing, but he's like, bro, I love you, man, and I don't want you to get your brains bashed in. And I know, like, you are a good fighter, but you're not that level. I'm not trying to insult you, but, you know, that kind of thing. So a true friend cares about you know, if he was a friend of pleasure, like, hey, listen, watch this idiot get knocked out. He's a stupid ass, you know? Like, you're just gonna chuckle. 
but you want them to be the best version of themselves possible. You want them to achieve the eudaimonia. And so when they fail, you, it hurts you too, right? When they don't get what they, you know, when, when they don't succeed. And when they win and when they when they succeed, it makes you feel good too. So in a way, you kind of share their happiness and you share share their pain, right? But again, it's it's something that can only develop through experience. It's not something that's just instantaneous, right? And for him, you can't really be happy without this. You can't have a complete, full, uh, self-sufficient life, you know, eudaimonic existence without true friendship. So I think there's parallels here though, but you know, again, for Aristotle and his metaphysics, he also thinks there's a grandiose cause. To be fair to him, he doesn't think it's really art worth art bothering about it. If we're a philosopher, of course, or a scientist, you know, he's living in ancient Greek, so, you know, scientists still talk about God back then, or what they call natural philosophers. You know, philosophers should worry about this stuff, but in our day-to-day -day life, to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be fair, I think Aristotle was kind of on board with, with, with Vonnegut. I mean, Vonnegut didn't really seem to believe in a God. Um, Aristotle did believe in a God, but his God was kind of like the God in the uh, religion in the book. Aristotle's God was utterly indifferent, or at least indifferent to us. Aristotle thought that um, this God was perfect and it only thought of perfect things. And since it was the only thing that was perfect, all they could think about was itself. So it's this narcissistic God, I get, that just, but you know, you can't hold it against it. It's the coolest thing ever. Like, what would you think about if you were the coolest thing ever? Like everything else would be boring, you know? It's like, you're not gonna watch Netflix. You can be like, I'm God, I'm awesome. Let me think about this, you know? He doesn't care about what sexual positions you're in or like what, yeah, how, how many grains of sand are on the beach or, so that's sort of Aristotle's God. For Vonnegut, he's, I guess, sort of agnostic, atheistic, and sort of says, look, stop trying to find that greater, higher, you know, meaning, because it's just gonna end in folly. Look what happened with Rumford. Look what happened with a lot of people, I suppose, in the book. Um, in fact, maybe we should start talking more about the book. I, I talked way more about Aristotle than I had planned. Uh, I thought this was gonna go by quicker than it, than it did. But anyway, um, Maybe, let me erase all this. Is that cool? You got all this down? Erase all this. Let's, let's do this. Let's try to get a list of all the relevant characters in the book. And maybe I could kind of kill two birds with one stone, give you a bit of a summary, but also at the same time, maybe address some questions that you have about how to go about writing your essay or something help you with some ideas here. So let's see here, how are we gonna start? I guess Rumford is sort of the first major character. So we got Winston, Niles, Rumford. And then we got um, Malachi, Constant, or Unk. And then of course, Beatrice Rumford. These are really the three main characters, I guess. After that, I guess it would be Boaz, Chrono. Who else am I forgetting here? Well, there's a lot, but I'm trying to get like, the, the more important ones up at the top and the, the more incidental ones lower. Um, I guess this is. I guess this is kind of. His, oh, I guess uh, what is his father's name? Noel or Noel? Noel Constant. And uh, let's see, Ransom K. Fern. Uh, what was the name of those two Martian agents? You could probably write something about them. The uh, Miss Wiley and, and Hel Helmholtz, Helmholtz and Miss Wiley. There's another uh, character that I don't think we've mentioned once uh, yet, but I thought about him last, like a couple days ago, I was thinking about uh, Moncrief. Who remembers who Moncrief was? I forgot the first name. Do you remember Moncrief? He's not in it very much. He's a butler. He's uh, Rumford's butler. So he, he, they mentioned him, let me find this. I think this is that the victory, the chapter called Victory. 
where uh, the Martian invasion takes place or whatever. Um, let me see if I can find the passage I'm thinking of. They mentioned Moncrief and how he took a big part in the in the uh, invasion. Do you all remember what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, nobody remembers. Yeah, what what, what was his his role? He. Yeah, he liked what he did too. I'm trying to find. It. I think, I'm pretty sure it's chapter seven. I just gotta gotta find that name, Moncrief. Okay. Yeah, the mastermind behind the, behind the Martian suicide was not, was Rumford. The elaborate suicide of Mars was financed by capital gains on investment. The Martian treasure was kept in Swiss banks. The man who managed the Martian investments headed the Martian procurement program and the market secret, Martian Secret Service on Earth, the man who took orders directly from Rumford was Earl Moncrief. So his name's Earl. Earl Moncrief. <clears throat> the ancient Rumford butler. Moncrief, given the opportunity at very close, at the very close of his servile life, became Rumford's ruthless, effective, and even brilliant prime minister of, earthlings, of, of earthling affairs. Moncrief's facade remained unchanged. Unchanged. Moncrief died of old age in his bed in the servant's wing of the Rumford Mansion two weeks after the war ended. Um, and I'm skipping that next section because then it talks about it again. Earl Moncrief the butler built his financial procurement and secret service organizations with the brute power of cash and profound understanding of clever, malicious, discontented people who live behind servile facades. It was such people who took the Martian money and the Martian orders gladly. They asked no questions. They were grateful for the opportunity to work like termites on the sills of the established order. They came from all walks of life. Um, and so, yeah, I think about this and I'm like, wow, it seems like, so he, he's a part of this servile class for lack of a better word. And he, he recruits the cadets from that class. And there are all these people that are just kind of discontented and kind of pissed off and apathetic about life. So they're like, yeah, you want us to totally destroy this whole, this whole facade of, of, of class or whatever? Yeah, we're on board. So I suppose like Helmholtz and his Wiley are supposed to be examples of that. Remember they they show up pretty early in the book. They're the ones that um, are at the bar of, uh, what's the name of the hotel? I forgot the name of the hotel, but the hotel that he, uh, his dad was living in. When, uh, when Malachi goes to, to read the letter, these Martian agents are in the bar waiting for him, remember? And they like didn't need to be brainwashed. They didn't need to have antennas in their brain. They did everything, like they just did it willingly because they were so apathetic and so like, you know, they were probably ex-butlers, ex-servants, whatever. And they're like, screw her. There's nothing on it for me. So I'm just gonna kind of like, you know, let it all go to hell kind of thing. What is that guy? Jordan Peterson, I think, used some metaphor like that. He was talking about, uh, I don't really watch that guy much, but I, he was talking about how if a society doesn't allow opportunity, what happens is a lot of criminality occurs because people don't have opportunity to do something or become something or find purpose. So because they think the game is rigged and unfair, there's no way they'll ever sort of succeed. They'll rather, they'd rather just sort of like toss the whole checkerboard aside, let all the pieces fall into chaos, and then maybe whatever whatever civilization or whatever organization arises from the ashes will be more fair to them, or at least it will be different. So I don't know, like, there's not a whole lot to go on, so I don't know if I would pick these guys, but um, it seems like he, he he died peacefully, right? Mokrit died, like, <clears throat> right as the war was ending, and he seemed to take he seemed to take relish in his activities. He did them very well. So I don't know. He's a potential character, not exactly somebody I would look up to, I suppose. But uh, uh, certainly, am I missing somebody here? There's certainly a lot of characters in the book, but I'm trying to find some that are. Um... Oh, of course, of course. How can I forget Salem? Yeah, he should be higher up. Let's see, I'll put him next to Boaz. Salem, good, yeah, the Tra Trafalgarian. Yeah, the, the maybe, I don't know if there's much to say about him, Bob, Bobby Bobby Vinton or whatever. Yeah, yeah, he's funny, 
but there's not much to say about him because you don't get a trajectory of his story, right? You get sort of, he, I think he's a good way of articulating this problem. Although he doesn't, you know, he doesn't believe in the void. He's a believer in God. But he has this idea, you're our arrogance, right? We're trying to build these towers like the Tower of Babel and trying to, you know, science is similar and God is kind of keeping us in our place and saying, shut up, you know enough already. Go back to earth and be a good neighbor. Be a good husband. Be a good friend. Be a, you know, be good that. Stop trying to find meaning in the cosmos. There's nothing out there, right? So I don't know if there's much to say about him, though, as far as, like, his happiness because it's just all you get is a sermon, you know? Um, Maybe, maybe, I don't know, if you're creative enough, you can come up with something original and think of, like, I guess you could say, like, maybe, I think he, imagine how he would have reacted. You think Bobby Vinton would have liked the new religion? No. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But in a way, I think the new religion shares some of his message. Obviously, the God is removed, but it's still similar kind of, like, stop looking for something higher when there's something here uh, on earth. Right. I guess Bobby Bennett thinks that something higher is the Ten Commandments and it's all spelled out in his little book or whatever, you know. But uh, I think one thing you can you can uh, do in your paper, too, is sort of weave these themes into your your the characters. One theme that I think this sort of I don't know, these almost go together. Um, determinism versus free will, knowledge versus ignorance. But it seems like and I made this point already a couple times. That's the characters that have the most knowledge, the most know, they know what's going on, are the least happy. Like, they're the ones that have the least fulfillment. I'm thinking of Salo and Rumford, particularly, right? Out of all the characters in the book, they have like the most inside scoop. They know what's really going on. Uh, the only person that knows more is us that read the book, I suppose, and we know everything that's going on. Um, but they, they know that second after the reader is Rumford and Salo, and they were not super happy. I guess Salo kind of pulls it together, right? He's like, well, screw it. And I was like, I already got halfway across the universe for something meaningless. Might as well finish this stupid meaningless task. You know, might as well do it. So, um, but it seems like, so Boaz and Chrono, to me, and this is my bias. I mean, you guys might have a different opinion, but I don't know, that's fine. But to me, they're probably the most ignorant and the most happy. Like, Chrono, and I think Chrono accepts his ignorance. He knows he doesn't know. He's kind of given up. You know, he's like, whatever you say is baloney. Remember, that's the first thing he tells his dad when he needs him. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, I haven't even said anything. He's like, I don't care. Whatever you say is going to be baloney. <laughs> you know, it's all going to be BS. They're going to wash my brain when I'm 12 anyway, so it doesn't matter. And so I think he sort of, like, accepted his ignorance. Same thing with Boaz. He knows he's ignorant. Right, you know, when he gets to Mercury, he gets stuck there, and how does he react? He laughs. He's like, "Oh, what an idiot! What a, what a predicament! I thought I was in control. I thought I was free, but all this stuff happened to me, and now I'm in the middle of outer space." Ha 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 ha! He's laughing at himself, and he's able to take it in stride. Uh, same thing with Crona. Remember how he, he reacts when he finds out that his good luck piece is, uh, you know, part for a spaceship. Everybody else is like, "What?" all of human history for a little scrap of metal so this alien that looks like a freaking orange with three eyeballs can say greetings to someone he's never met ah you know but he's like yeah that kind of makes sense and he's like at peace with it he's like yes that's totally the culmination of all yes and he drops the the good luck piece and in, in the scattered remains of salo thinking oh it'll all work out in the end he just has this sort of naive uh but uh, almost beautifully naive sort of faith and is able to become this beautiful bird boy right? like, to join the most beautiful creatures on the planet that he's stuck on I suppose so. no constant I suppose in a way he dies in a similar well kind of in a, he's not he's not as um He's definitely not as knowledgeable as Rumford, but you could say that, like, remember in the letter that Noel wrote to his son, uh, he is like, just like, I don't really know why I'm lucky. I don't know why I keep making this money. I gave up on life. I was pretty much dead when I got to this hotel room. And then I just had a wild hair up my ass and said, you know, I'm gonna use this money I got from my uncle and invest in the stock market. How am I, what am I gonna invest in? I can't read all these letters. I don't know what they mean. Oh, I'll just use a Bible and I'll use the letters from the Bible and just do that. Oh my God, it's working. Now I'm a bazillionaire. He's like, 
And he's, he dies thinking it must have been for something. Maybe it's for you. Maybe you're the reason I existed. And you're for something else, right? This sort of Aristotle teleology. There's got to be something higher. Maybe somebody out there likes me. There's got to be some reason. Uh, but he sort of dies never knowing that reason. But he kind of has faith in it. So I suppose he's not quite as screwed as Rumford, right? And Rumford's like, well, that message has got to have something great in it, you know? Yeah, in a way, maybe that maybe that's a. He doesn't seem like he's not portrayed that way. He, he's portrayed as dying in a very bitter state. But maybe you could think if you were Rumford, you might comfort yourself by saying, "Well, maybe the message is really important. You know, maybe the message is like going to save a whole galaxy of life forms or something, or it's like the cure to some disease in some far." Like he doesn't know. It just says greetings. You know, so maybe it's better to die in, in ignorance but still hopeful there's a higher purpose than sort of be knowing pretty much everything and kind of knowing what the purpose is, but not really what's inside that darn bottle, not be able to open the message, right? You existed to deliver a message. Well, what's the message? Can't tell you, sorry. Can't tell you. God, that reminds me of Kafka. There, anybody ever uh, read uh, Franz Kafka? And they ought to make you read this stuff. There's so many classics and nobody even knows about them, you know? Like Kafka's great. Kafka wrote The Metamorphoses. Nobody's read The Metamorphoses. About a guy that wakes up one day and he's a cockroach or a bug. The opening line, one day, Grayer woke up and he was a bug. <laughs> it was like, and his parents were like, you're late to work, son, what are you doing in there? And he's like, I can't get up, I'm on my back. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny story, but it's actually kind of sad too, because poor Grayer doesn't, you know, not able to survive. Um, but Kafka in the castle, he has this parable. Um, how does it go? It's basically like, oh, there's a message that's just for you. This, the king of China, right? This is again a parable. There's no king of China. The king of China has a message for you and it's going to tell you everything you need to know. But in order for that message to get to you, it has to travel all the way across the great wall. And before it has to travel across the Great Wall, it has to make a thousand, you know, leagues journey through the sea. And before it does that, it has to do this. So he keeps going and going and adding in all these barriers. And basically, you're never going to get that message. All right, you're never going to get that message. Right? Kind of reminds me of Waiting for Godot, too. We talked about Waiting for Godot. I don't know if it was in this class. Did we talk about Waiting for Godot, the play? The two people just waiting and waiting for Godot to show up and he never shows up. And it's a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor for how some people live their lives. Uh, waiting and waiting and maybe you know once I get this or once this is done then it'll all sort of work and I can't do it until till I've done that and kind of putting it off instead of just sort of accepting the here and now I'm not really quite sure what Vonnegut's doing with time here most of his novels uh, have this this as a major theme is time the relativism of time the way we experience time as punctual, right? We experience time as a point in it, moving along. It's always the present. But in Vonnegut's world, and I guess to some physicists, if you believe in some new wacky theories like string theory and some quantum physics, that time is something that is just like a human thing. And we experience things in time, but really all things are happening at once. I mentioned The Watchmen before, that comic book that they, they did a movie of. The, the guy, Dr. Manhattan, the, the blue guy, who, who's able to, uh, he's basically God. You know, he, he can change anything. He can change matter, manipulate it with his mind. But in the book, he apparently also sees time the way that Rumford sees time. He right? just sees it all at once. In fact, on the TV show, they did a sequel to the comic, and I... I didn't really like this character that much. She was annoying, but she was she was the wife of Dr. Manhattan or Mr. Manhattan. And uh, Manhattan doesn't have much passion. He's just this like, I know everything, I'm a guy. And he's like, I, I'm in love with you, but I fell in love with you 20 years from now or something like that. And she's really angry at him. She's like, how could you love me if it hasn't happened yet? He's like, it already has happened. He's like, you just haven't experienced it. You know, and spoiler alert, she like dies to saving his life. So like the, the final episode, she like sacrifices herself so he can live. And he tells her right before she does it, he's like, this is the moment I fall in love with you. She's like, really? 
he's like, oh, wow, why? And then like this guy comes out of the bushes to shoot him and she's like, sees the guy, and jumps him, sacrifices herself. And he's like, because you sacrificed yourself for me. And he's like, why didn't you stop it? He's like, I couldn't have it happened. It's always happened. It's never gonna not happen. He's like, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Just accept it, accept it. Right? So I don't think that, you know, even though I'm kind of picking these guys out, <clears throat> to me as sort of like the characters that do the best with what they're given, um, don't seem to me like they have any sort of relation with time that is somehow significant. So that to me, I'm like, how does this sort of, yeah, sure, Vonnegut, there's this notion of time that's, that's all times happen at once and we're stuck in the moment. But it seems to me like these characters don't think about the past or the future so much. They're just thinking about now. You know, they're giving it up, right? So like Boaz is just thinking about the harmoniums. He, get, he trails off when um, Malachi tries to truth him, right? When Malachi comes to say, hey, I found the, the secret. Let's get out of here. Let's, let's leave. And, he's, and he gets distracted because he's thinking about, should I go to Earth? Should I go there? What should I do? And in the process, he hurts his harmoniums. He's like, oh, crap. You know, he left that moment. He left the present and, you know, that connection. And then he runs out and he saves it. He's like crying because some of them died. And like, he's very attached to these things. So again, in Chrono too, right? I think he's sort of given up hope on some future or whatever. Although I suppose you could argue there's gotta be some sort of temporal something, some sort of temporal understanding. Because remember, what does is, what is Chrono do at the end? There's only one thing he does that's somewhat civilized. And it's very random too. Yeah, to visit his mom. Wait, what did you say? Oh, I was, I, I... Yeah. I lost the last part of the question. <laughs> I just you know, there's something he does that to me that that relates to time. You know, birthday is a commemoration of one year of life. So you know, I guess he does have a certain relation to time. Not much. I suppose to be a good bat ball player, you have to have time or something like that. But we're, y'all were mumbling back there about something. Did y'all have something to add or some question or anything? Um, to me, this guy. I don't know, what do you want to say about him? You know, this is the guy who thinks he has all the answers. And I would argue falls flat on his face. He does seem to, um, I guess this kind of ties into the theme of determinism and free will. He does seem to have an understanding of luck. That's another major theme of the book. He seems to kind of understand that there's a lot that happens that has to do with luck. So even though he's this smart businessman, he makes it all the way through what Harvard, I think is where he went, or Yale, or he's Ivy League, right? Went to Harvard and learned all this stuff, and, and but he his professor said, you gotta find your man. He's like, what do you mean? He said, you gotta find your man. And Noel Constant was his man. So he knew about luck. I guess he, he accepted that you, you need a little luck, and Constant was his good luck, his good luck piece, I suppose. But how'd that work out for him? Where do you think he found meaning in life or tried to find meaning in life? Ransom K. Fern. He gave this long speech as soon as he met, you know, he's like, he's like, I got a new job today. And he's like, oh yeah, with who? He's like, with you. Oh really? Why should I hire you? And he's very confident and he gives this whole spiel about bureaucracy. He's like, you made a million last year, huh? Well, I could have shown you how you could have made 10 million. And I'm gonna build this huge bil uh, building with so many bureaucrats that the IRS won't know what the hell to do when they try to, to audit you, basically, right? You're gonna have so many people making so many mistakes, having so many papers, hiding stuff, making stuff up, like no one will be able to figure out anything and I know how to do it, right? So I'm basically going to make you even richer than you already are. And I'm gonna, how did you put it? I'm gonna basically break the spirit of the law by just staying right within the letter of the law, basically, right? So basically I'm gonna find loopholes and cheat and extract as much wealth as possible. Why do you wanna do that? I guess you don't really get much from this character, right? He's not really mentioned much, but that's like, what's his goal in life? Yeah just to be a business, successful businessman. And he achieves it, right? And then all of a sudden, bad luck, right? 
aliens come down and want Malachi to be a part of their army, so they make him go crazy, brainwash him, and, you know, well, I guess that happens later, but it's all part of the plan, right? That's a fun thing. I don't know if this is really that helpful for you if you're going to write your paper, but that's one thing that, that's a funny, a fun thing to kind of contemplate. Like, how much of the activities in the book are we supposed to equate to the actions of the Tralfalmagorians? Like, how much did they actually do? I mean, there's so, because how did the good luck piece come about? That little strip of metal? Do you remember the origin of that? Yeah, it was just some random event on like a field trip to a flamethrower factory. And the guy that was giving the tour was walking down the hall or whatever and this little piece tore into his foot. He's like, ow. Oh. And then he walked back and he did it again. He got angry at the thing, took it up and sawed it up. He was like, oh, stupid piece of metal. Ah. Hacked it up into a bunch of pieces threw on the ground and Chrono was like, oh, that looks cool. Picked up a piece, walked off with it. Like, how did they plan that shit? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he kind of admits that, like, they have this UWTB, which makes them able to do stuff. Like, they can actually travel, fall, like, ten times the speed of light or something like this. And do all this stuff. And it's like, geez, like, um, that sounds kind of ridiculous. In a way, this is sort of what makes, uh, to me, I love, don't get me wrong, I love conspiracy theories. Like, a lot of my friends are like, how can you love them? They're so horrible. They hate they hate Alex Jones, and they're like, oh, he's evil, he he hurts people, he's all like, I'm like, yeah, but if you're dumb enough to follow this, I mean, it's, I blame it on our educational system. I think that if people were more educated, they wouldn't fall prey to some of these conspiracy theories. I think they're fun, though. They're a lot of fun, you know, like <laughs> lizards and stuff, running crap, and sometimes I can't blame people for believing this shit, but to me, my big beef with them is they give humans way too much credit. I'm like, that's like, we are not that smart. Like, in order to pull all that off, and get all this stuff. I think what happens is conspiracies are real, but it's not because of some freaking guys in suits in a room with cigars planning stuff 10 or 20 years ahead of time. You no, know, they like, they react. You can't predict humans. Humans are unpredictable. We do stupid stuff. You can't, they didn't know Trump was gonna win. Nobody knew he was gonna win. I, I kind of, I didn't know, but I, I, I knew, I knew, it, well, I knew it was possible. I knew it was possible. And all my friends were like, there's no way, you're an idiot. I'm like, dude, he's a lot closer. The polls are very close and polls suck. And like, I follow politics pretty, pretty closely. I don't really have a horse in the race. I think all these people are idiots, but you know, I was like, look, I was like, I know the, 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 the temperature of our country and he's saying shit that people want to hear. I don't think he believes any of it. I think he's making crap up. I was like, but he might win. Like, he will never win. <laughs> oh, you think he'll win? <laughs> and I'm like, the next day I'm like, yeah, I told you. <laughs> I told you he could win. I told you. So, you know, we've got this sort of like, again, the more arrogance. <laughs> like, I oh, know, I know. There's a sort of certainty here. I totally lost track of what I was talking about, sorry. <laughs> what was I on? I'm talking about time, purpose. But, well, a friendship, I guess too, like I, I can only think of, I suppose Beatrice and Unc, or you know, B, B and Malachi, they fall in love. You know, that's that's a form of friendship for at least for like Aristotle. Aristotle talked about friendship, like he, he had true friendship with his wife. I mean, that's what we, we call love or romance, but that's a form of true friendship. If you love someone in that romantic sense, you care about their happiness, you care about their well-being. So Boaz loves his harmoniums. He cares about his harmoniums. He wants them to enjoy the beautiful music. He loves to play music for them. I guess Chrono loves his birds or something. He loves his mom and dad too. Remember he says, thank you, mom and dad, at the funeral, All right? So there's love there. Um, is there love in any of the other characters? Is there any friendship? I guess Rumford has his dog. Salo thinks, but he's kind of destroyed at the end. He's like, yeah. That's the other thing kind of ties in. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to tie in the Aristotle with that because remember um, Rumford says, I guess we were useful to each other. I guess we had some use for each other. You know, I had ends and you had ends and we helped each other to those ends. That's a friendship of utility. That's not a true friendship. I think Salo knows that. He's like, I was used. You use a machine. You don't use a friend, right? You care about a friend. You, 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 you're concerned with their well-being, right? And so, yeah, I think, but Salo tried. I think because Salo knew. I guess he's, he's a, a advanced enough life form to realize this is something special and I got to try this out, right? I never heard of it, but I got to try this out, right? 
But yeah, I guess these two, that's sad. I guess, again, Unk and B fall in love with each other, so I guess that counts as a friendship. Boaz has friends with the birds, I guess. I guess like, I'm kind of going out on a limb, but we'll call them friends. And he does care. He does love his mom and dad and, and, and that. No, constant. there's no love for that guy. Like, I don't love any. He doesn't love his son. He doesn't love the woman that, that visits him. He doesn't seem to really have any passion. He's kind of given up on life, right? I mean, same thing. With, I guess we don't learn enough about maybe Ransom Kid Vernon has friends, you know, apart from his business. But I tend to think he probably doesn't. He see, sounds like a guy who's married to his career, and that's all it's about, right? There's not enough to say about these two. They're only in one scene. I guess they're friends with each other. They seem to be enjoying life, like as, as Martian uh, uh, generals or lieutenants. I forgot their title. Right, they're they're kind of enjoying all the different drinks in the bar at the hotel. They're like, "What's that? I want to try some of that." You know, so I don't know. Same thing with him. I don't think he ever had friends either. It seems like he was just sort of like Rumford's little lackey. How about purpose, though? I guess who finds purpose? You could argue that Rumford had more purpose, but it was not exactly the kind of purpose he wanted to have. Right. B likes to be used though, right? That's another thing, B, and this is something I think I skipped last time, so I'm glad I just thought of it. That's another, and at the end of the book, remember B, one of the last things she says is thank you for using me. One of the worst things in the world is not to be used, which is the opposite of the white, the white uh, pony in the white dress who doesn't want to get dirty, doesn't want to get used, doesn't want to get blemished. Now she's like, thank you for using me. If, if I don't get used, then I'm, you know, there's nothing. So it's almost like, kind of takes it as a compliment, right? But yeah, um, I suppose Rumford was super, like, if you're just talking about the, the just the, the sheer delivery of the part to Titan, he played the most important role, I suppose. But it's hard to say that that would give him a more fulfilling life. I suppose Boaz could see his purpose as nurturing the harmoniums or something like that, right? <clears throat> I wonder why Rumford uh, uses the harmoniums to tell Boaz that they love him. Because I think he did. I don't think the harmoniums did that themselves. I don't think the harmoniums got smart all of a sudden. They're like, let's organize and spell out the word, I love you, Boaz, don't leave us, please, right? Why did Rumford do that to Boaz? Maybe Boaz would have just gotten in the way of all the ceremony on Earth that would have been like an extra person that wouldn't have had any role to play. Maybe that's it. In a way, I think that this is a, a gift to Boaz. Maybe. Like, it's almost like an act of mercy. I don't know, I'm being too nice to Rumford. Maybe he was just like, oh, this guy's gonna be in the way. Let's just keep him here on Titan. And it was totally selfish. That, that he did that. But I'm thinking maybe he did that because remember, Boaz didn't want to be truthed. Don't truth me, okay? Don't truth me, Unc, and I won't truth you. Maybe the, the Harmonians don't love him. They don't even know who he is. They just know vibrations. They just know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Glad you are, glad you are, glad you are. That's all they know, right? They don't know shit. But Boaz thinks they do, and that's enough. And that makes him happy and content, right? So in a way, I guess you could say that might be an act of mercy on the part of Rumford to at least trick Boaz into thinking that the harmoniums actually do want him to be there. Right? We love you, Boaz. Don't go. Don't leave. Anyway, what is B's purpose? Does she have any purpose in the whole book? Yeah, well, she's got a, she's kind of Chronos, like, guardian, I or you, is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, yeah, she's there to make sure that the that Chrono, because I guess he would have like not been able to survive without her. You know, they got real close and they helped each other survive in the jungle. I think her purpose was to be used. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, sure. Well, all of them were to be used. All yeah, of them. Yeah, but were I think she was the only one that really found the like peace with that purpose. Right. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, yeah, I guess, well, her true purpose, right? Because Boaz might think his purpose is to 
be a good dad to the harmoniums, yeah. right? But his real purpose was to be like, I guess, on 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 uh, Mercury with Unk or whatever the heck. But her true purpose was to get the freaking uh, thing, yeah. and then she's like, well, you know, that's cool. At least I was used. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's a good point. Um, suppose I guess his purpose was to have Malachi. His purpose was to make this guy even more rich. Anyway. And I don't know, again, in your, in your essay, um, you, you probably shouldn't spend a whole lot of time dealing with these issues on a philosophical level. In other words, uh, you don't want to spend too much time defending a theory of free will or defending a theory of determinism. But what you might do instead is talk about, you know, in the context of the novel, certain characters are presented as more free and some are presented as less free than others. Obviously on Mars, the people with the antennas are less free than the people with the remote controls. You know, you could say that. If You could also argue that maybe Rumford is the most free of all, but you could also argue the opposite because he's stuck in the chronoclastic infundibulum, right? Like, yes, like he's sort of, he seems to have more agency because he's sort of directing everything, but is he really directing everything? That's sort of, you know, that's the sort of thing. This is, I guess, the big joke. I don't know if it's a joke is the right word, but it's like every chapter in the book, maybe not every chapter, but as we progress through the story, it's like we pull back even further, get like a bigger picture, and the people that we thought were free are actually not, you know? So like, you know, Boaz is a good example. You know, we thought he had more freedom than the other Martians, and I, I guess, he did by some degree, but he wasn't completely controlling his fate as much as he thought he was. He thought, he's like, I'm gonna pair up with this ump guy because he's a, he used to be rich and he's gonna show me around the Hollywood nightclubs. And he's got this whole plan and then all of a sudden, boom, fate comes crashing in. So, anyways, who's the luckiest person here? I don't know. I hadn't, I hadn't asked myself that question. You said Boaz is the luckiest? You think? I think Kronos, the, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, would you want to be a bird boy on Titan? <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to be, but it seems like out of every other character, who, who would you, if you had to be one of these characters, who would you be? I think I, I think I'd be Chrono. I think I'd be Chrono. <laughs> Which would I think would be like given like my you know love of culture and society that would suck just living with birds all the time. But anybody else got it? Well, you're gonna say something. You want to be Chrono too? Someone? I love birds. What's that? I love birds. You like birds? I don't like birds. I can't. Well, I don't mind them in the wild. I can't. I used to have. A, I had a. I had a girlfriend that had a. a what, cockatoo or whatever? Oh, I hate them. I hate pet birds. My grandma, grandma can't stand them. Oh, I hate them. I hate them. <laughs> can't, they're the most annoying animals. Well, they're dangerous. They are not friendly. They are not friendly. They are only friendly to their master. And even then, they're not that friendly to them. No, they will bite everybody. No, I've known. I like my, my, my mom dated a guy that had a parrot. I was dating this chick with a cockatoo for years. It's so annoying. They're so loud. They just, rah, rah, you know. like, people should not have birds. Birds, <laughs> go back to your tropical island, fly, fly. I like you there. You're, you're pretty. You're, I, the parrots are beautiful birds, but yeah. Oh, yeah, my mom also had a neighbor, this, this, this uh, veteran, retired vet that was just walk around the apartment <laughs> complex with this. There's a chick that goes to, what's that bar? Uh, over there, uh, Axel Rods or Axel Rad. You ever been to Axel Rad's like an outdoor bar? There's a chick that goes there like every weekend with her freaking bird. It's so annoying. <laughs> she's got a pair. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. yeah, she's, oh God, she annoys me. She annoys me, man. She thinks she's so cool with her bird. Look at me, that bird. She's always a service. Oh, I can't stand that chick. <laughs> she, maybe she's a nice girl, but I, that pair just, I'm sorry. Man. I mean, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what time about parrots here. I better stop. What uh, what time is it? Time to go? Yeah, it's time to go. All right. That's it for today.